better by God's grace. And um, so we get to share at a hospital. That's, that wasn't my plan that day, but maybe the Lord wanted somebody to. Uh, there was no other way I would get in a hospital other than that, put it that way. And, uh, and, and God had his way to minister to people there. And uh, just pray that whatever was said and whatever was shared, it would be for God's glory, even in those conditions. So thank you for your prayers, feeling much better. And uh, um, your prayers overwrote the prayers of those who were praying differently. And uh, there's plenty of enemies. So despite their prayers, God didn't answer that one. God answered your prayer, and we're here. Um, and pray for those that are at the hospitals that need to hear God's word. They're around death so much and around things that are so deep. And um, how could they not think about eternity? Um, I did have a friend, still my friend, and uh, a nurse. And um, she's around many people with cancer, oncology, and things like that. And one time we talked about, you know, what does it feel like to work with oncology patients and things like that? And she never thought about it. She never thought about the fact that she could get cancer one day. And it's kind of like that bias that we have as humans. We never think it would be us until it's the day that it's us. And so pray for nurses like that. And there's some believers there. And praise God for some of them that I met. And uh, like I said, it wasn't my plan to be there, but uh, God had different plans. And thank you for your prayers. We're getting ready for this to start. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Chris, I think I'm just going to restart it. I think it's working now. Let's see. It should be on. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We do have communion today. And uh, for the sake of uh, trying to be... uh, uh, private? Am I private? Yeah. For the sake of being, uh, I guess for brevity's sake, we will try to um, keep it as short as we can today in this passage. Uh, we're going to look at verses 2 to 16 today, 2 to 16. And uh, I think I told Susie that I'm going to try, to try to be a little shorter today. And she couldn't, I brought her to the brink of her faith. She couldn't believe me. She could not believe me that I would be short today. So uh, <laughs> I told her I lacked faith too. And uh, there we are. I lack faith, too. We just could not imagine being short today. But we'll do the best we can. And uh, about 14 verses. And I do have to tell you this. You probably are going to be either very upset today or, um, or you're going to say, well, that's what that passage means. Uh, because there's tremendous controversy about this passage. There's been churches that have been literally split over this passage here. And the reality of it is it shouldn't split us. It shouldn't be like this. Oh, I forgot to put this on. But there's tremendous division among the churches over this particular passage. And it has nothing to do with deep theological things. It's not the resurrection. It's not the divinity of Christ or the person of the Spirit or whether man has sinned or not. It really has to do with outfits and what you wear. And, um, and you say, that's really kind of an important thing, isn't it? Well, it shouldn't be to that degree if we understand what maybe what Paul is saying. Uh, but people have misinterpreted this passage or interpreted it in different ways. Let's see if I can. Oh, yeah, here we go. So Paul here is going to be talking about, interestingly enough, about seemingly hair and what you wear on your head. And many people have found this passage controversial because he's been talking about liberty. He's been talking about freedom in Christ. He's been talking about so many wonderful things that a Christian has. And now he's going to get into the details of what you wear. This couldn't be, is it? Or is there more to this than what we think it is? Is there more to it than just hair and attire and um, hats? Uh, God looks on the outside No, God looks on the inside, the Bible says. But why do we care so much about the outside in this passage? Uh, I think for two reasons. If we understand the passage, and I'm going to try to be as, for brevity's sake, but also as deep as we can get into it, is it's important for angels, and it's important for society to see godly behavior and modesty in God's people. I think that's a, you can sum it up that way, but we're going to talk about quite a bit about uh, how society is to be, how church is supposed to be the model for society. How will they know what God expects and wants unless God's people really are behaving in that way? 
and society will take its cue from godly people. And uh, we don't have to live like the world. We can live like the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness and mercy in our lives. We ask you, Lord, for your strength today to be able to uh, do your will, to serve you, and to understand this passage. No doubt, Lord God, this passage has become, um, in many different circles, maybe contentious, maybe hard to believe and understand. But, uh, Lord, we do pray today that you give us that hope, the hope of eternal life. In Jesus, amen. All right, so Paul spoke about liberty. Amen? He spoke about liberty. And he spoke about freedom that we have in Christ. And that's a wonderful thing to have. But Paul also spoke about the importance of being a good witness. Verse 2, all the way to verse 16, it's really about how to behave in church, how to worship the Lord together in the role of men and women. And um, could somebody volunteer to read that, verses 2 to 16? Somebody can just read it loud and clear. Brother Rick, go ahead. Loud and clear so all God's people can hear it. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to, to the traditions, just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a, of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord... Neither is woman independent of man, nor man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman. And all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? Uh, yeah. but, yes. but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. Amen. Now that's up to verse 16. And uh, verse 17, we'll begin to speak about the Lord's Supper. And that's going to be for next week, although uh, I would have liked for that to be today, but nonetheless... This is unique for Christians. What does it mean? It means that the fact that details about this passage has to do with God's order of society. God did not intend his children to live in a democracy, per se, where everybody has a vote. God did not intend for it to live in a dictatorship. But God intended for us to live under a kingdom, under a kingdom. And that kingdom is for him to set the orders, the orders of what churches are to follow, what Christians. It's the key to it all. Verse 3 is the key to it all. Chris, I don't know if that went in and out, but uh, verse, verse 3, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and that the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of the Messiah. That verse alone, it's the key to understanding the whole passage here. Um, you can make it about hats and hairdos and things like that, which in a sense, do resemble a part of this text. But it's really more about the Lord's order of society and in churches. Look at the fundamental principle. Very simple. Christ, man, and woman. If you want to go a little bit further, God, Christ, man, and woman. This is not explaining inferiority, but an order. An order of how God wants his people to be. God is the head of the Messiah, 
the Messiah is ahead of men, and it's talking about males, and of course, for women, the head is their husbands or the man in her life. Now, the word men and women here uh, can be translated husband or wife. So there is a bit of an ambiguity here whether Paul is referring to marriage or whether he's referring to everybody. Uh, so this is where the discussion comes in. Uh, I believe Paul is talking about both in a very real way. He's talking about both how men and women are to be. Uh, but he praises them. He says, you have good instruction. In verse 2, you remember the traditions which I believe I gave you and you are going to follow them now. And new instructions are coming into play. The structure of the family. The structure of the family. And look what it says here. There is an order that God has established. Every man, verse 4, has something on his head while praying and prophesying disgraces his head. Men have an authority, and that is Christ. Men have an authority, and that's the Messiah. And we're to have, for men, have the same relationship with Christ as Christ has with God. It's a very important thing to remember. It says, every, the head of every man is the Messiah. How's your relationship with Christ today, men? Is it in the same way that men, that Christ has it with the Father? And that's the important point here. No man has the right to talk about his authority, God-given, over his wife, unless that man has the same relationship and under the authority of Christ. It will be an offense, it will be hypocritical for man to say that he has authority over his wife in that way, unless that man has the same relationship that Christ has with God. This is an important, important thing to... I'm talking about men right now more than anything else, husbands especially. When a man becomes a dictator, the family goes wrong. When a church or society uh, is ruled by dictatorship, like men trying to rule, it goes bad too. And so we have a direct command here from Christ that men ought to be under the authority of Christ if it's going to be a good society, if it's going to be a good family, if it's going to be a good church. Your relationship with women has to be in proportion to your relationship with Christ. How is that going? And therefore, you'll see that relationship with women be better if your relationship with Christ is better. It goes hand in hand. Now, for ladies, your relationship with a man, when a, man become, when a woman becomes a Christian, she doesn't stop being a woman, right? We're all the same in Christ, salvation, redemption, things like that, but she's still a woman. She's capable of things differently than men. It does not mean in any way inferiority in this passage. Many people have taken it to that degree, either hats or women's lib. They go so far into it that they become either women, uh, men's hater, men haters, or they hate hats or something like that. It, it's, it's destructive. It, it's really, uh, and I'm trying to be as sarcastic as possible in a sense, but also with the reality that this is true. This happens to a lot of churches. They split over this inferiority complex, or it's about hats, or it's about hair, which it does talk about hair, but not to the same the sense that we think of um, as the only thing that matters. So relationship, relationship with men, for ladies, right, um, has to do with your relationship with the Lord as well. Relationship is characterized by submission in this case. The man is submitted to Christ. The woman or the wife is submitted to her husband. How is that relationship going? And that reflects a relationship with Christ. Um, if you want to know, ladies, how to submit to your husband, study the life of Christ and see how he submitted. And you'll have no problem understanding submission. Look at how Christ submitted to the Father, and always. And for men, how to lead has to do in proportion to how Jesus was submitted to the Father as well. Because if we're submitted to Christ, then that relationship would work. Now, verse 4 is where it gets very interesting. I, I needed to preface that verse 3 because otherwise you will never understand, you won't understand the rest of the passage. 
It has to do with the order of things, the way God intended it. Not because God is uh, capricious or trying to destroy people, but because God is faithful. And he wants to give people the right order in order to exist. Verse 4. Every man has something on his head while praying or prophesying. Uh, this grace is his head. Now, it has something to do with prayer and prophesying. So this is a time where the church comes together. This is not just some meeting down the street at your house or, or something specifically or just having a barbecue or anything like that. It has to do with when the church comes together. When a man prays, it is it says here, it's shameful if he, or disgraces his head, if his head, uh, if he's not covered. Every man who has something on his head, oh, I'm sorry, that it is covered, on his head, while praying, disgraces his head. Well, what does that mean? Now, I have some examples in the Old Testament here. Aaron wore a turban on his head when he prayed and he prophesied. Now, uh, on the turban, it said, holiness unto the Lord at the front. And, uh, and he wore it when he went in to see the Lord. He wore it at different times. If the apostle was speaking about a headgear in verse 4, you know, if a man who has something on his head, you know, if you have something on your head while you're praying and prophesying, if Paul was speaking about a turban or uh, something on your head, then Aaron must have been the, one of the worst, uh, uh, I guess, uh, dishonoring God in all kinds of ways because he always wore a turban, something on his head when he prayed, when he went to seek the Lord. So it's unthinkable to think that Paul here is saying everybody in the Old Testament, priest and Aaron, was dishonoring God because he wore something on his head. So what is he trying to say? Uh, look at Jesus, the life of Jesus as well. Jesus went into the synagogues and he preached and he prayed and he honored God and uh, every Jewish man in the synagogue had to wear a prayer shawl, something on his head, in order to participate in the synagogue. Will you tell me that Jesus was uh, a sinner? He was dishonoring God because he wore something on his head? Or the man who wrote this text is Paul the Apostle. In the book of Acts, we read that Paul, everywhere he went to the synagogues, wore, um, or he went to the synagogue, had to, by custom, wear something on his head. Still to this day, Jewish people do that, either on their head or on their skull. So if a man prays with his uh, head cover, is he dishonoring God or is he talking about something else? Look at verse 5. Every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her head cut off. For it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off and her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought to not to have his head covered, since he is the image of the glory of God, and the woman is the glory of man. For man does not, did not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. We'll get to verse 10 in a moment. But if a woman prays with their head uncovered, Paul says it is shameful. Uh, this here, of course, is talking about the idea of headship. Think of head, authority. A man does not need a head covering because his authority is who? Christ. When he goes in, he doesn't need to show it, doesn't need to symbolize it. But a woman, when she prays or prophesies, needs to have a symbol of authority. And in this case, she needs to, what's her symbol in authority? Her husband, right? And this is what it's referring to here. It's the idea of authority. Is the wife submitted to the husband? Is the wife submitted to the husband? If not, it doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter how big your hat is, right? It is going to be shameful unless your head is covered. See, what Paul is referring to here is not hats, it's not hair necessarily. He is speaking about hair. He will, it's, it's not denying that. But the symbol of authority, right? It is the symbol of authority. Is that woman under the headship of her husband? A man doesn't have to wear one, Paul says, because he already has a head. It's Christ. But the woman has another head as well. Not just Christ, but her husband. It's Christ through the husband, a better way of putting it. So she needs to wear one, 
It says uh, in verse 5, when she's uncovered, where praying and prophesying, she disgraces her head. And it's talking about authority. It's talking about is she usurping authority from her husband and prophesying and praying without maybe her husband's uh, approval in that regard. Maybe she's not under the authority of her husband. And she's doing it to usurp authority only. Not to, not to glorify God, but is actually doing the opposite. By not submitting to her husband, she's not using her proper head. She's not under the head. The head of every man is Christ. The head of women is man, her husband. So when a woman does not have the proper covering, it says, she is uncovered. Her head is uncovered. There is a usurping of authority from her husband. Now remember, this is, if you're talking about women's lives, you're like, well, what? everybody's the same. Well, why do we need authority? Why do we need this? Well, this is God's intention. God's intention is that we all live in harmony, in a family, in a church setting, in relationship with the Lord and with one another. And there always needs to be an order of things. There needs to be an order of things, not just a, a free-for-all. A free-for-all becomes very chaotic. And so Paul is laying down some guidelines to when you meet together but also to represent something more. Yes, there is hair. Yes, you can wear a hat if you want to. But go beyond that. It's the authority. Are you under the authority? Men, talking to husbands, are you under that authority of Christ? Meaning that you have no room to say anything to your wife unless you are under that authority. Are we clear on that? That should be a man's study, right? It, it, that, that is in proportion to your relationship to Christ. Then that's your authority in your home, in a marriage. And I mean authority not to rule and govern, but to protect and to serve and to be the head. Now, most marriages end up like this because of the improper way of dealing with the order. Here, a woman in a church setting does not have her head she, verse 6, let her also have her hair cut off, meaning that it's a shame for a woman in a, in a ministry or a church setting that is unbelievably rebellious to her husband be in any way prophesying or praying in a church meeting, meaning that there's, a, there's, a, there's something's off. It's the same way of a husband. Uh, let's say in the book of Timothy, we're told that a pastor, an elder, a deacon needs to be a husband of one wife, needs to be a good husband to his wife. It would be shameful to have a husband who is not a good husband to his wife become a leader in the church. It would be just as shameful because it's, you, what's his authority? Well, he doesn't have one. He's, he's rebellious toward Christ because he's not honoring and helping his wife. He's not being a husband as he ought to be. Let's keep going. Verse, uh, verse 8. For a man does not originate from woman, but woman from men. For indeed, a man was not created from the wo for the woman's sake, but woman was for the man's sake. Uh, here, woman has a, a high place, uh, but the place is not the man's place. It's a different place. It's a different order of things. The creation. Look at the creation story. Paul goes back to creation. Look at Genesis. Who was created first? Who came from men? Woman. Is that interesting, right? The beginning of it all was man, God creating men, and women coming from men. Sounds like a weird thing, isn't it? But it's true. Man did not originate from woman, but woman from men. And for men, it says. Well, what was the reason God created woman? He needed a helpmate, right? He needed somebody. In, and the word helpmate, it's a very beautiful Hebrew word. It means a helpmate. It means somebody next to you. Excuse me, not under you, not above you, somebody with you, somebody that can, that can coordinate with you and participate with you. It's, it's a beautiful Hebrew word that does not mean inferiority. It means supplement. It means encouragement. It means all kinds of beautiful things that a woman was to be for her husband. This case was Adam. And God did not, in, did not did it the other way. He did it the right way. He did man, and then he did woman. Was that a mistake? No, because from that point forward, after Adam and Eve, every man comes from a woman. Is that interesting? So now a man can't say, you can't live without me. Because right? a woman can say, well, you can't come into this world without us. Right? 
And, and, it's, and a woman can't go to her husband and say, you know, we can live independently of you. No, because it all started with the man. And so man becomes the, uh, God's tool or God's uh, instrument to originate the human race. But in order to propagate the human race, God uses women. So what's the, is there a coordination here? Is it a participation? Is it a joining together, a partnership? Absolutely right. You see, a woman cannot exist without a man. From the beginning, in the original creation, right? A woman cannot exist without a man. But then men depend on women. In order to be born in this world, you can't do it. You can't do it without God. I mean, you can't do it without God, of course. God's in all, but you can't do it without women. And so a man can, cannot overrule that. And I cannot say, I don't need you. Or, you know, what, what, are, what, are, men good, what are women good for? He can't say that, because otherwise he wouldn't be here. In verse 10, therefore, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority. See, this idea of symbol of authority is very important here. Over her head because of the angels. And I guess really interesting here. Um, because of the angels. Interesting verse. Not just for men, but for the angels. Remember, angels look upon the church, both Peter and uh, as well as this passage here. And Jesus talks about angels are aware of the church, are aware of the children of God. Book of Hebrews talks about it as well, ministering spirits. But what are angels supposed to do in this situation? To see a woman that's not have her head covered. Uh, she doesn't have a husband, I guess you could say, or she's not willing to submit to her husband. Um, a woman doesn't, oh, sorry, verse 10. A woman had to have a symbol of authority because of the angels. Now, remember authority? Remember usurpation of authority? What happened to the angels at the beginning? Right Before creation started, there was a rebellion of angels headed by the chief of that rebellion was Satan. And Satan led a third of the angels away from Christ, away from God. And therefore, they rebelled against God. And so the angels today look upon that. They look upon the children of God today, just like it happened before, and look to see if there's any rebellion. Is there any rebellion among, and this is an interesting thing, who did a, the, this, this fallen angel, this wicked angel called Satan, who did he go after at the beginning of creation? Went after the woman, right? Went after the woman. Don't know where Adam was. We're not going to speculate necessarily, but certainly the influence of Adam was not present at the time that this happened. And so we have an influence of an angel, fallen angel, of insubordination, the chief of all rebellious, influencing a woman in the garden. And fallen angels, of course, also went after that because in Genesis 6, we're told another story of angels and women. And this time... It was angels who uh, seduced and propagated with women in Genesis 6 and produced a terrible, terrible situation that happens that the Nephilim came from that in Genesis 6. It's a horrible situation that happened in Genesis 6. So we have another temptation of angels and women without the proper headship of covering of husbands or authority in their lives. And angels went for the women, Satan went after the, the woman, Eve, and you have terrible things happen. Because of that, there is a, a really important thing that women have to, have to do. Number one, authority. Are you under the proper authority? If you're married, it's your husband. If you're not married, it's Christ, but if you're in a church, it should be leadership in the church. That's what God has appointed leaders and elders to be the husband of one wife and things like that. They have to be a male authority. There is a male authority in the church, according to Scripture. Therefore, a single woman, a single lady, that needs to have proper headship, it's either her dad that's a believer or the elders in a church that are believers as well. But there's always a relationship with males. There's a male relationship in purity and in holiness. Notice that thing. There, it's not saying, get away from men. You know, you're it's just going to cause a terrible fall. It's just, no, it's the proper one. What's the proper one? A Christian father for single ladies. A Christian elders, believers, elders who are uh, authority in the church. But a woman ought to have that because otherwise, look at this, because of the angels, Angels look upon the situation of authority. 
is a woman uncovered? It's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? Are there maybe fallen angels who look upon rebellious women in that way and say, ah, they're just like us. They're just like us. Look at that. And there could be temptations to formulate this idea of rebellion against marriage, against churches, against families. Because they fomented that with Satan being the chief. You see, ladies, how interesting it is that the Bible is very consistent in terms of temptation and the order of the family. Women are oftentimes attacked in that way. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So the next book in Corinth was written a few years later. Look at chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 1 through 3. Somebody want to read that loud and clear? God's people can hear it. Yes, Livy, go ahead. Purity of devotion that is in the Messiah, in Christ Jesus. And look at the serpent, right? The serpent comes to Eve to deceive her with craftiness in your minds. And so this has to do with temptation. And this is, of course, it's, it's bigger than just a woman in particular. It is speaking to the church, the church in Corinth, and how Paul was concerned that that church as a bride Notice the theme of marriage. Notice the theme of uh, uh, purity. Notice the theme that Christ is married to or will be married to the church. But notice the usurpation, the usurpation of authority that comes with the serpent. A fallen angel who's become the devil comes to a woman to deceive them. And Paul says, look, as a church, we're like the bride and there's going to be a serpent. There's going to be this idea of usurpation of authority that's going to Pull us away, let us stray, that we would rebel from Christ and his devotion. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11. Let's put a, let's put a bow on this because we've got to get into communion. Um, in the Lord, women have a, an order of authority. Wife has a submission to her husband. Husband is submission to Christ. That, that husband needs to be in submission to Christ to have any authority in his home. That's absolutely clear. No doubt in the Bible. Things go wrong when a woman notices or her, his wife, the wife notices that the man is not as close to Christ and therefore she can become resentful of his hypocrisy, can become resentful of his inconsistency. You know, you tell me to do this, but you don't do it, that kind of thing. And so a husband is to strive to be the head of the home and to be in godly relationship with the Lord and then with his wife. Verse 11, however, in the Lord, neither is a woman independent of man, nor man independent of woman. That should be plastered on every wall that I can possibly think of. There is no independence from each other. There is an interdependency on each other. Remember, a man cannot be born today without a woman. But a woman cannot exist unless you believe the biblical creation of Genesis, that a woman came from men. And so... It's an interdependency. There's a relationship there. Verse 11, independent of, of man? Nope. Nor is man independent of woman. There's no man that could say, you know, I don't need you. All things come from God. For the woman, verse 12 says, originated from the man, but also the man has his birth through the woman. But all things are from God. All things are from God. And therefore, there's no division. There's no inferiority, but rather dignity, inequality in God, inequality that won't compromise God's order of things. Now think of this, think of Jesus. 
Is Jesus inferior than the Father? Is he inferior than God? Absolutely not. In fact, he considered equality with God something that he didn't want to hang on to. He was so equal to God, he had to put it down in order to come as a man and submit himself. It's something Jesus had to empty himself of that. He never stopped being the son, but that privilege of being the son, he had to lay it down. Uh, therefore, we would never say Christ is less than the Father, but there is an order of submission. You would see Jesus in the book of Acts and in, uh, in the Gospels, as you say, uh, spoken of in the book of Acts, as Jesus following the will of the Father and doing exactly uh, what the Father wanted him to do. There's equality, but there's an order. With marriage, and women and men, there's the same. There is equality. Men and women are equal. They absolutely. And they owe each other their origin. So there shouldn't be any chauvinist here. Right? And there shouldn't be any feminist in the sense of fourth wave feminism today. There shouldn't be that. Why? They are partners. They are partners with each other. Equal, dignity, equally sinners. Amen? Amen. And a lot of people say that. <laughs> equally sinners, equally redeemed, and equally will be glorified. There's no ranks, there's no division. They're the same destiny, the same Christ, the same spirit, but nonetheless, the husband is the head of his wife. And, you know, women put their hand on their hip at that point. You just said we're equal. And why are you saying now that there is a... Because there's an order. There is an order in the church. There's an order in the family. Who established that order? God. Imagine the angels, right? There's an order among the angels. One of them didn't like that. Why do you call the shots? Why are you the one doing all this? Again, because of the angels. Because of the angels, there is a structure that God wants for his church. And as the angels look upon the church, they see that order that God desires. Right? Now, there's other things, too. You know, having an authority, having somebody, it means that you're, you're not going to rebel against God, especially if you're married. You know, especially fallen angels. Think about fallen angels, right? Uh, looking upon women. And he says, which one is in rebellion with God? <laughs> which one's under, uh, under the rebellion of her husband? Because that's really what it is. Right? And uh, there is an issue of modesty here in terms of, you know, if you're uh, a wife, you'd be modest. You'd be modest toward everybody else. You're feminine toward your husband. Of course, your femininity doesn't change. But you're more feminine with your husband. But you're not as feminine with uh, other men. Right? There's a modesty level here because of the angels. Angels look. They look upon. And it's interesting that women are specifically mentioned here, not the men, because it all started with the temptation of an angel toward a woman. So women have to be discerning. I mean, ladies? Yes. Women have to be discerning. And women have to be modest. And women have to be feminine. And women have to be smart. And women have to be absolutely resourceful. Because there's an attack on women. What do you think the whole feminist movement is about? Yes. It's an attack on you, attack on the family, attack on your children. And so women have been tempted. Now, this happens in the church, but when it spills into society, you get what we have in society. You get confusion. People don't know what to believe. Is it you know, one woman, two women, three women, four women? I mean, what, what, where does it stop? What kind of family relationship are we going to have? Verse 13, judge for yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Now, remember, we're not talking about hats. Let's get past the hat thing, right? Now, if you want to wear a hat, ladies, by all means, come. I love them. I've seen great, great, great hats in churches. I've been to churches where ladies wear hats. Um, and uh, if you don't want to wear a hat, fine. I mean, it, it goes well with some dresses, right? But some people don't like to wear hats. Uh, and that's fine. But you want to wear a hat, wear a hat. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about having your head uncovered. We're talking about the authority that God has given us and the authority that we're under as well and the authority that God wants to exercise within the church. Now, is it, is it shameful for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? What means this? How is it? It would be this way. I went to a church one time and uh, a lot of hats, put it that way. A lot of big hats. And the bigger the hat, 
the bigger the spirituality or pseudo spirituality. Many ladies with hats, but they have the biggest mouth, the biggest foul mouth, the biggest gossipers were the bigger hats. You see what I'm saying? The bigger the hat, the bigger the mouth. The bigger the gossip, the bigger the foul mouth. The bigger disrespect toward the husband. I've seen it. It, just, it was visible. I was like, why do the ladies with the bigger hats have the biggest disrespect for their husband? You know, it, it, they were trying to cover something. Yeah? They were trying to cover it up that they didn't have the right respect for the husband in relationship with them. So they covered it up with a hat. Oh, she must be godly. Look at her hat. Can't even see the pastor behind her. Right? That kind of thing. Did the hat do anything to her? Absolutely not. It brought no spirituality to them at all. It's not the external thing. Paul is not talking about you should wear a hat or not. If you want one, like I said, Paul is about liberty and freedom. I think we ought to take a page from Paul. It says liberty and freedom in Christ. However, there's modesty and there's authority and there is relationship and there's respect. And respect, I should say. And if a woman is not, it doesn't matter how big the hat is, it won't work. It's shame. To stand up and pray and say, Lord... I love you. I miss you, Lord. You're so awesome, Jesus. And turn around and just debase her husband, right? It would be, unsha- be shameful to do that. That's what Paul is saying. Under the proper authority, it's the right thing to do. Under no authority, it's a very hypocritical thing to do. Verse 14, does it not nature itself teach you that a man has long hair is a dishonor to him? And if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair has given to her for her covering now, he's talking about hair. At the end of the day, he's not the, it wasn't talking about headgear. He's talking about hair. So Paul gets down to the hair thing. And remember, it's the order of things. When a society has lost its compass, women will look like men, and men will look like women. Right? Romans 1, all about that, right? In a society that has lost its compass, godliness... No longer the church is salt and light. No longer the church is influenced. The right order of families. The right order of relationships. Right? Why do you think we have so many divorces in society? Anybody? Why do you think that? What's that? I can't hear. Sorry. Women's lib. Yes. That's, that's, a, that's a big one. Anybody else? I think it's uh, the order is lost in the church. All right. Now we're going to get that. Women's lib is a... It's a, by, it's a result of the wrong structure in the church. You, don't want to know why, you want to know why there's so many divorces in society? Because there's so many divorces in the church. That's it, plain and simple. You don't have to like, get a degree in sociology to do that. 100% right. There are as many divorces, well, the church is probably more now than society. Even society shames the church. Pastor divorces, pastor this, pastor that. You know, women in the church divorce their husband, marries the, uh, the piano guy or whatever. You know, it's, uh, we don't have a piano guy, but anyway, uh, you know, things like that. And it's like, and even the, the world blushes, even the world blushes at it and go, oh. but society is a reflection of the church. If the church has lost its structure of family and church order, then the society is going to be just as lost and just as blind because we have become just as blind as just as lost. So this is not a, a, a course on, you know, uh, Puritanism. People go, oh, back to the Puritan age. You know, women have to wear this, have to do that. Uh, no. Women can be women. Feminine women can be resourceful. Women can be intelligent. Women can be very, very smart in their field and things like that. But when it comes to the order of following the Lord, there's an order of following the Lord. And we have to be willing to do that. Because otherwise, well, there's the angels, their society looks upon it. Now, in Corinth, it was a terrible society. Corinth had no structure of morals and behavior in society. So the church was really the only compass that they can look at and say, well, how does a family look like? Look at the church. But if the world can even look at the church for a model, what is it going to do? Well, it's a free-for-all. It doesn't matter if it's a man and a man and a woman and a woman. and It doesn't matter because there's really no... Structure. The church doesn't have it, has lost it, doesn't teach it anymore. And so here it is at the end. Does that even nature itself tell you that there's rules for men and rules for women? In a sense of, I will never be compared to a pretty lady. I couldn't. 
I can't. I'm an ugly dude. I'm just, I'm just, it's put it that way. It just, it's just the way it is. I could never, I mean, unless, you, you know, anyway, I was going to say something else. But anyway, some certain health director that just got nominated. But anyway, uh, the, you couldn't confuse a woman with a man in that sense. It's just nature itself tells you. Certain things, physiologically, biologically. But what happens in our, in our society, in an insane society, it begins to switch. It begins to flip. Bottom line is this verse. At the end of the day, this is it. The head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man, or her husband in this case. They're used interchangeably. Same word. The head of Christ is the Father, God. And if we can understand that, you wouldn't have a problem with head covering or hair or long hair. Even nature itself tells you that there are certain things that a man can look like and does that are masculine. And there are certain things that a woman in her glory and her beauty is feminine. Only an insane society flips them, right? Only a society that has lost the compass of God's order because the church has stopped teaching it. Then it becomes so confused that it becomes nothing. It becomes absolutely a free-for-all. Now, notice here the hair. It's not talking about length of hair. Like it's, it's, There's no inches here, right? It, this is an inch. This is two inches. This is three inches. You can't have it over four. You can't have it over five. But it's talking about the way a woman normally looks and the way a man normally looks. And in this case, even nature itself, men look different than women. There's no doubt. So there is an order and there is a, an authority that God wants us to have. And so that is verse 16. But if someone's inclined, somebody could say, well, I don't like what you're saying. Well, Paul says, I have no other teaching in the churches, nor have the churches of God. They have no other practice. This is the order that God has established. The head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is her husband. And the woman, and, uh, yeah, the woman uh, it's her husband. And the head of Christ is the father. This is the way God has established it. And we really are bucking against the, the way God intended it, the origins, but also society itself in which that was we're called to do. So that's what the apostle is saying. I'm going to stop in a minute, in, a, in just a minute, just to give you some practical things. Um, the chief important passage is this one. Make no doubt about it. Forget the hair, forget the hat. It wasn't about that. Although Paul uses it as an example to say, look how women look, look how men look, look how society... Um, you know, especially in the different kinds of societies, sometimes uh, longer hair is acceptable, sometimes shorter hair is acceptable. It's just social norms. But a man looks like a man, and a woman looks like a woman. And their roles are different. Um, the importance of this is that the strong feminist movement, the fourth wave of feminism in the Western world, right, um, they say that we came from primitive men. We came from the caveman. And in the caveman society, you needed men because they went out and killed the dinosaur or got killed by the dinosaur. But either way, uh, they brought, they, we needed the men to protect us because right? it was just an insane world. But now that we have evolved into a more modern society, you know, we're not out there killing dinosaurs. They're not killing us. So we don't need the patriarchal society. We need a matriarchal society. We need more feminists to be in part of, uh, uh, of men, and we need feminists, we need women to be in charge of the world, we need women to be in charge of families, we need women to be in charge of all these things. And, um, and they said this is, it's, it's switch. Man's role has become women's role, and women's role becomes man's role. And because, they say, um, because the only difference is biological. The only difference is bio biological, therefore our roles are interchangeable. This is what feminists say, feminism says, that it doesn't matter. You don't need a man anymore because we're not chasing dinosaurs. At the, you know, just save you a lot of reading. At the end of the day, we're not in a patriarchal society because we don't need them. We need a more sophisticated society. For instance, women are more sophisticated, they're more intelligent, you know, they're more resourceful, then uh, the, you know, it's time for the matriarchal society to overrule the man society. Now, what causes this, causes two things. Men become resentful because the woman wants to rule over them. And they distance themselves from that relationship. 
and therefore there's very, very few guys, young guys, that want to get married anymore, who wants a woman telling them what to do all the time. Right? It also empowers women in a, in a, in a wrong sense, that they don't need a man. They don't need to get married. So they'll live a single life, and most of their young adult life will be single. And therefore, more prone to sexual temptation without a marriage, without a marriage partner. More, more prone to sexual activity without a marriage partner in those, in those years, in those age, in that age, which is, it's, uh, you know, you grow up and you got hormones. You grow up and you like, you have, want to have a relationship, but you're so against the traditional marriage that you don't want a marriage. You just want a one night stand is what we're told now. And that's what they get. And they get to their 40s and 50s, and I'm getting older too. And, I'm, you know, and they look back and they say, what was it all about? STDs and broken hearts. That's really what they have at the end of the day. And they look back at their grandma and say, my grandmother was much happier than me. Because she was married to your grandpa for 50 years. Yes. And she raised your parents. And she raised many times their grandkids. Yes, they got it right because God knew that that's the right way. Unfortunately, that's not the biblical view that we find today in society. It's not the biblical view that we find today in churches, unfortunately. God made them male and female. Therefore, there are differences, but there is equality. There are differences, but there is redemption. There are differences, and there is partnership, and there is very similar, uh, similar roles that we play, but they're different. We both have to raise our children, right? We both have to praise God. We, the roles become different. So the glory of a man, the glory of a man, I'm talking to the man now, is that a, man, a woman was made for you. That's the glory of a man. And we, we, we see it in marriage. When you got married, maybe somebody said it like this, right? The glory of a man that there was this woman made for you. Praise God for that, right? And every man is happy because a woman was made for him. Weren't you happy the day that you got married? No, not a lot of smiles from the guys here. What's going on here? Oh, man, we need another course. All right, book the calendar. We need a major, major uh, uh, workshop. But the humility of the man. So this is the glory of a man that God has provided a woman for me. Amen. Amen. Yes. Wow. So let me get Anthony. We need a man's Bible study pretty soon. But the humility of a man, you know where the humility of a man comes in? Is that he's not complete until he marries her. Amen. Man, that just brought you down quite a few notches, right? The glory of a man is that God has provided a woman for me. Amen. 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 And the humility of a man is saying, I can't be complete without her. Amen. Amen. So stop treating her bad. Right? That's the reality. Now, the humility of a woman is that she is made for the man. Okay? In, in the reality of God's creation, she was made for a man to be married. The glory of the woman is that she alone can make him complete. Amen. The humility of a woman is that she's made for, for a man. She's, you know, she, okay, in the role of God, I have to submit to the reality that God wants me to submit to this godly man. Right? That's the reality. And a lot of women struggle with this. Don't get me wrong. I have five of them at home. You know, I kind of can tell you that something's a little testy there. You know? But I can tell you this. The glory of a woman, the glory of a woman is that she alone can complete a man. And they work, both work together. One without the other is a big zero. It's not one. <laughs> it's a zero. Because remember, they become one. <laughs> They become one, not two. They become one. So love and submission is the key. The key to understanding marriage, the key to understanding your relationship with Christ is submission. Submission, submission, submission. Is That's reflected on earth through the church. As God looks down at the church, is the church reflecting that wonderful relationship between Christ and the church. And as the world looks at the church, do they see that? And as angels look, you know, they never thought about angels, right? Talk about God, talk about men. But what about angels? What did they see? Jeez, Louise, what happened? This is starting to sound like a familiar story, they might say. <laughs> this is what happened earlier. And so the devil is trying to destroy the pattern. Believe me, he'll try to destroy the pattern. To break it between God and Christ, he tried, didn't he? 
Did he try to break the pattern of behavior and, I'm sorry, of submission between God and Christ? Yeah, it happened at his temptation. Luke 4, Matthew 4. Three times he tried to break Jesus from doing opposite of the Father's will. Three times. He failed because Christ said, there's only one God and I'm going to serve him. That's it. There's only one God and I'm going to serve him. But the devil is trying to break it here in this society. To break the relationship, to break women's relationship with men. That's the devil's role, to break women's relationship with men. To tell you that you're inferior. To tell you that if you submit to men, you're inferior. Don't do that. I mean, come on, really? So women's live. The devil loves women's live in that sense. I'm not talking about equality. I'm talking about the hyper fourth, you know, fourth wave. Because it destroys relationships and brethren to the men. The one that the devil is going to succeed, if we're not careful, is to break our relationship with Christ. To break our relationship with Christ. If, you, if he breaks that relationship with Christ in you, it's like a chain reaction. It'll break all the other relationships. Right? So, ladies, the devil will go after you and your husband. Men, the devil will go after you and Christ. Because he knows that if he breaks that link, your link with your wife, your link with your children, your link with your fellowship and friends will also be broken as well. That's what he wants to do. In society, it's getting further and further away from God. And that's what you see the problems. That's what you see um, men no longer putting themselves under the authority of Christ. And they're incapable of leading a family, a church, right? House to house, many house to houses that I have visited over the years, many, not all of them. The woman's a spiritual leader. I'm glad someone's leading, but I'd rather have the men lead. Oh, pastor, you're such a chauvinist. No, 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 I'm trying to prevent you from bigger problems. Um, when a woman leads, she doesn't do her other roles that God has called her to do. It's too much on her. Too heavy on her. She's not made for that burden. Man was made for that burden to carry because that's what God said. You carry my burdens, the Lord says. I'll give you a burden. I'll give you my yoke. Part of that yoke is lead the family. And if it's put on the wife, she can't do it. She'll be taxed. She'll be tired. She'll be completely ineffective in the other ones. And so the man... Unfortunately, in many marriages, the man tags along with the wife. She's just a tag along, right? And he's relinquished his role within the family of not being a spiritual leader. He's relinquished that. In God's sight, he's relinquished that because he's not wholly devoted to Christ. And therefore, you see the result. You see the result. And then the women react to this, right? And they think they have to be strong and they have to be everything because he's not a leader. He's not a leader. And so husbands, you know, pay attention to that. We really affect the home in more ways than you can think of. You know, our laziness, our apathy affect the home spiritually much more than you think. And so the happiest family is when the husband is under the authority of Christ. And if you're single, this is what God is preparing you for. But you don't prepare the day of your wedding as, okay, now I'm going to really follow Christ. No, you prepare before by following Christ, even as a single person. As, uh, as uh, um, our dear brother Daniel read today, how does a young man keep his way, right? By taking heed of every word, by hiding it in your heart. Psalm 119. Under the authority of Christ is to love and to honor and to obey. And you know what happens? When a woman sees her husband obedient to Christ, loving Christ, she will submit very happily to whatever he desires for the family because they know it's going to be good. Now, it's not saying dictatorship. There'll be a leadership and there'll be a direction that the family wants to go because every husband should be leading his wife. Every husband in this room should be leading his wife to Christ. You need to be a better Christian you ought to strive to be a better Christian to lead your wife, right? Every husband should, should strive to be a better Christian in order to leave his, lead his wife. And the devil loves 
when the wife becomes the leader. Because the problems will come. Because the problems will come. Now, I don't mean like, well, somebody's got to lead. Yeah, I understand that. But you know, if it's not fixed soon, it's going to become problems. If it's not fixed soon, it'll become problem. I'll leave you with that. I've said enough, I think. And uh, hate me, love me, leave me, I don't know. But uh, uh, it's what the Lord had put on for this. Amen. Because churches have split over hats. Did you know that? Churches have split over hats. The size of hats. The kind of hat. Churches have split about long hair. You know? And, and, you know measuring. You know, how long is, you know, how long is long? Well, the Bible doesn't tell you that. Did you notice this? There's nothing. He just talks about the role of men, the role of women, femininity, masculinity. There's an order. There's a role. Right? Now, some special men have had long hair, right? Look at Samson. Samson was all his strength was there, right? John the Baptist, his strength was there. You know, so it's a special calling, but he's, that's a different calling. We're talking about order, masculinity, order in the home, order in the family, order in the devotion to Christ. A man has his role, a woman has his role. And together they make a wonderful partnership that ought not to be broken. But boy, the devil wants that. Boy, the devil wants to destroy it. And so one last thing about women, I forgot about the hair thing, because somebody asked me uh, a while ago when I taught this before, well, what does it mention hair then? What's the point of hair? You have to read 1 Timothy 2.9 and 1 Peter 3 to complete it. And we don't have the time to do that, but I wish we did. 1 Timothy 2.9 and 1 Peter 3. What does it say about women and hair? It says, be careful that in church, the boys think about the gospel, not about the girls. You know what I mean by that? Be careful that in church, your hair is not so flamboyant that the guys will think of the girls rather than the gospel. They need to be thinking of the gospel not of your hair. They need to be thinking of Christ, not of your beauty. Now, great looking ladies, right? Praise the Lord for that. But the point in church is Christ, not the, not the beauty. Plus, if you read Peter, it says the, the, the real beauty of a woman is what? It's in the inside. A gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. That is the beauty that you should look after and seek after. That's Peter's point. That's Paul's point. Let the woman not be adorned so flamboyantly in her hair. Braided hair and all those things, right? Adorned. Nothing wrong with it, but don't become so far out of the way that it becomes about the girl, not about the gospel. And that's Paul's point. That's why he mentions hair in this, in this passage. Or no, not directly, but other passages help us understand why the hair. Because women have been blessed with beautiful hair. It's the glory of a woman, her hair, right? A man can, bold, can be bold and still be uh, a beautiful man, right? But it's more, yeah, a man can be, and still be a great-looking guy. But, you know, it is shameful when a woman loses her hair. Even nature tells us that, right? Um, and so the hair becomes a stumbling block for many men in churches, and the adorning and the braiding and all, the flamboyant, that's what the hat thing, you know, it just becomes this, this super aggregated thing. And Paul says, be careful. Be careful of your modesty. Be careful of your submission. Look what the world sees. Look what the angels see. Let alone what God sees. And don't let it be about you, but about the gospel. Oh, would it be great if ladies all over in churches would point men to Jesus rather than themselves. I think there'll be a lot less issues <laughs> in churches if women took that on. And men, to be so devoted to Christ that it will be about Christ, not the girls. Wholly devoted to Christ and not the girls. And um, sometimes that could get a little blurred. Especially if there's, there are godly women in the church and you'd be like, well, I don't know about, you know, is it God? Is it godliness or is it me? <laughs> uh, but God has a way to put people together. So don't worry about that part. People stress out about that a lot. God will put something together. Men and women in partnership and relationship. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful that over the 
minutes that we've had together, we learned a lot. We learned about behavior in the church. We learned about modesty and submission and integrity and honesty and and being submitted to you, Lord. And there's nothing greater than submission to Christ. There's nothing more godly than being a man or woman that is submitted to Jesus 100%, wholly devoted. And we thank, we're thankful, Lord, that you've made that pattern clear. You made it in the scriptures. You also gave it in nature. That men are men and women are women. And we can be different, but yet be in equal status under your grace and under your mercy. So, Lord, I praise you and I thank you for this time that we've had. May the marriages here in this fellowship, Lord, be full of you, full of the Spirit, full of love, full of submission, the right one, the right submission, Lord, the perfect kind of love, the love that cares, the love that puts another one first and cares about the other person and individually serves the other person. And, Lord, in a submission that it's under you and ultimately will seek the best of the other person to love and submit and respect. Lord, we have so much to learn. We're thankful that through your Holy Spirit, you can make us what we ought to be. Forgive us, Lord, what we have not been. Forgive us, Lord, for not being what we ought to be. But I thank you that by your Spirit, you can make us what you want us to be and we ought to be. Lord, I pray for the relationships in this fellowship, marriage, relationships with one another, and I pray, Lord God, that they would be blessed because they did it your way. I pray, Lord God, that we'll be a good testimony to the angels. We'll be a good testimony to the world. We'll be a good testimony, Lord, to one another so that the glory will not be the hair. The glory will not be anything of our own, but the glory would be Christ. The glory would be him, for he deserves all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand before the Lord. Oh, not stand. Uh, who's going to do communion today? Praise the Lord. Oh, you are. All right.